So tonight's video comes from Mr. Ballin, and it's called The Worst Death Story on the Internet. And it got me to thinking, you know, a lot of people don't really like too much talking about this type of topic or, you know what I mean, thinking about death or anything like that. And I was thinking, I was like, what is the worst? Like, how do you want to go out? You know what I mean? I don't think about this either, full transparency. You know what I mean? I don't like to talk about it either. So this is this is being, I don't want to say vulnerable, but whatever you want to call it right now, I'm being that. You know what I mean? But I think for me, you know, because everybody, everybody wants to go in their sleep. Everybody, you know, wants to go in their sleep. I think the scariest type would be, for me, would be like drowning. You know what I mean? being able to see where air is but just can't get to it i think that would be like extraordinary but i don't my bad i ain't trying to damp i leave it to mr ball i feel like i'm damper in the mood right now opening up this video all right so here we go worst death story on the internet all right so if you're new hit the subscribe button all of that good stuff and story time mr ballin style let's get to it at three places you can't go and people who went there anyways. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once or twice every week. So if that's of interest to you, please offer to do the like button's eyeliner, but use a wide tip black sharpie. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. hop in a boat just off the coast of Aberdeen, Scotland, and you cruise eastward, after about seven hours, depending on your speed and the weather, you would come across this massive man-made structure jutting up out of the ocean. It looks like a cross between a construction site and a corporate office building sitting on top of 100-foot-tall metal stilts. It's called Magellan, and it is an offshore oil rig, and it will remain in place until all the oil has been sucked up in that area. The people who work often for weeks or months at a time on rigs like Magellan are known as roughnecks and they have one of if not the most dangerous job in the world. All exterior surfaces on these offshore rigs are always slick either with water or oil and so there is a constant risk of falling sometimes hundreds of feet. If you're up on a higher platform you could fall to a lower platform which could be fatal or you could fall clean off the rig all the way to the ocean 100 plus. So basically you got a live with a harness on at all times pretty much you know what i mean i'm always wanting to be attached to something that way if i do slip it catches me for real for real form which could be fatal or you could fall clean off the rig all the way to the ocean 100 plus feet below if you add in some bad windy weather the risk of falling increases tenfold also the crude oil that these roughnecks are drilling for is highly combustible and so fires are a huge concern as well and if that wasn't risky enough there's also this phenomenon known as a blowout where basically the oil well that the drill is actually drilling into will just explode now all risks rigs have some sort of mitigating equipment to try to save themselves in case this occurs. But in reality, if it happens and you are unfortunately near the drill when it happens, you are likely to be killed or maimed. While the downsides of working on an oil rig are fairly obvious, the upsides are too. Namely, your pay is fantastic. In 2000, a 41-year-old father of two named Gordon Moffat was a roughneck working on the Magellan. His primary job was to perform maintenance on the drill. Now, these these offshore rigs work great most of the time, but they do have a habit of breaking down fairly often. And for a drilling company, any time they are not sucking out crude oil, they're losing money. And so it was just a known thing when you worked on one of these rigs that as soon as there is an issue that causes the drill to stop working, it must be fixed immediately. Whether it's day, night, horrible weather, good weather, it didn't matter, it had to be fixed right away. And so on the night of October 9th that year, Gordon had just gotten back to his core. Like, how do you work in those conditions? And I get it. The whole time he was talking in the beginning, I was waiting on him to say, but these dudes make incredible pay. I, I knew that was coming. Anybody sitting here watching this video knew or was thinking in the back of your mind, like, yo, 
they making bank. But, you know what I mean? If you're not leaving it behind for your children or, or your spouse, and you just out there for yourself, are you, you run the risk of not even enjoying the money you gonna make. Well, my fault, let me, let me mute this. You run the risk of not even enjoying the money you gonna make. So, I'd like to say I would never, but you, we all know you could be down on your luck. You go get that skill and go out there and make bank. You know what I mean? So I'm not knocking them, but that's a scary job. And I used to work at a paper mill. So seeing stuff like this is a little bit similar. Um, also a little bit dangerous, not as inherently dangerous as this is, but being in certain areas, that's why I was talking about the harness. You know what I mean? Having your harness strapped to you all the time and clicking off bro is and like he said if it breaks down at any time you sleep it don't matter let's get to it it's a hurricane and it don't matter get to it like that's crazy because then it makes you think these big wigs who are sitting back and who you know what i mean are running these companies and different things like that they don't have the danger but they benefit you're down there you know what i mean risking your life and it's like, get it done now. You know what I mean? That would irk me. Like, no mind, like, y'all don't care that it's, the hurricane is here? No, get to it. That, that would irk me. Orders to end the day when he got a call on his radio that he was actually needed to come back out to fix a problem that had stopped the drill. Now, Gordon was a seasoned roughneck and he had grown quite accustomed to these late night calls to go out and fix things. And so he wasn't annoyed. He just put his stuff back on, turned around and he headed out the door. When Gordon got to the main deck, which is this wide open metal platform right in the middle of the rig where the drill actually passes down through it on its way to the ocean. When he got to the main deck, he was met by some of his co-workers who told him where he would need to go. The cabling that needed fixing was located right below the main deck. However, it was not accessible from the main deck. In order for Gordon to get to it, he would need to go down to the next lowest platform from the main deck. Basically, he would need to hop in an elevator and go down one floor. And from this lower deck, the crew on the main deck would lower down a harness attached to a long wire. They would feed it down through this hole in the main deck platform called a mouse hole. It was about 10 inches across and they would feed it down and he would grab the harness, he would put it on and then he would signal up to the main deck crew who could literally see him through this mouse hole. They would turn around and they would signal somebody called the hoist operator and they were located above the main deck slightly back. They so a lot of trust goes into this operation. You, you can already see, you know what I mean? And for a person like me, I got to really know that you know your job because I'm trusting you with my life. Everything about this story has to do with somebody's life could potentially be over with in the blink of an eye. So I got to trust you. That's where it stops for me couldn't actually see Gordon. So they're relying on communications with the people on the main deck and the hoist operator would start their winch and a winch basically reels in the wire that was connected to the harness that was on Gordon. And so once the hoist operator was informed, he'd turn on the winch and then Gordon would be raised up until he could access these cables and then he'd do his maintenance and be lowered back down and that would be it. Now, Gordon and the crew had done maintenance using this winch system many times before. So this was a very routine fix. So Gordon made his way from the main deck down to the slightly lower deck and he looked up at the mouse hole and he watched as the main deck crew members lowered the harness with the wire attached to it down through the mouse hole. And so Gordon grabbed the harness, he put it around his waist and he secured it. And after he was sure it was on correctly, he signaled up to the crew on the main deck that he was ready to start. And they in turn turned around, they flagged the hoist operator who started the winch. And so very slowly, Gordon was lifted off off the platform he was standing on and he was brought up after several minutes all the way up about 10 feet to access these cables and as soon as he was parallel with them he waved to the main deck crew who were not far from him at this point and he said I'm good and so they turned around they told the hoist operator who stopped the winch and so Gordon got his tools out and he began working on these cables and the whole time he's trying to stay in one place because the wind is whipping through and he's kind of dangling and swinging around and then eventually he finishes the repair the cables are good and so he signals the crew 
crew on the main deck through the mouse hole that he was good to go. You can lower me back down now. And so the main deck crew, they turn, they wave to the hoist operator to go ahead and lower Gordon. And the hoist operator, he gives a thumbs up and he starts the winch. However, the hoist operator accidentally forgot to switch the direction of the winch. And so, oh my God, oh my. See, this is what I'm talking about, trust. Trust, you gotta trust that somebody don't make a bonehead mistake that costs you your life. You gotta put trust in that person to make sure he's paying attention. Now, you don't know if he's dealing with some spousal issues this day. Maybe his old lady called him and was like, listen, got on his nerves, teed him off, whatever. You don't know if, you know what I mean? He's sick, he's dealing with something, boss got on his nerves, he got in trouble today, written up, this may be his last day, he's extra nervous, not paying. You don't. No. And see, like I said, that's where it stops for me. I got to rely on you for my safety in my life. This is crazy. So when he started it again, instead of the winch spooling the wire out and lowering Gordon, it continued to reel the wire in, pulling Gordon upward. Now, the winch did not move very quickly, and so it wasn't like Gordon is rocketing up towards the mouse hole. However, this problem was immediately recognized by Gordon and the main deck crew, and so they're frustrated. They're yelling up at the hoist operator saying, stop, 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 reverse the winch. They're all waving and flagging this guy down. But the hoist operator, after he had hit start on on the winch had just kind of turned around because this is a routine thing they've done a million times before and so he's not looking at the crew on the main deck so he has no idea what's going on and it was so windy and loud that night on board the rig that he couldn't hear their cries and so the winch just continued to reel in the wire slowly raising Gordon closer and closer to the mouse hole now Gordon could not get out of his harness unless he was on the platform below so there was no way to escape the situation he was in and so Gordon, after a few seconds of this not stopping and him continuing upward, he starts screaming. He's not annoyed anymore. He's terrified. And so is the crew on the main deck. They are now frantically screaming at the hoist operator to stop. Where's the radios? Why they don't have radios? I'm guessing the frequency out there, you, you know, you're not going to get a good... I don't, I'm just asking questions because I don't know. So if y'all can enlighten me in the comment section, if you know, then maybe uh, I... You know what I mean? Maybe you, you the, the frequency, you can't get a good frequency or something. Like, give us, it was satellite work? Like, I don't know. I'm asking questions because I don't know. But, man, if we got these type of conditions, give us some type of communication devices. If we're known, if you know that wind conditions can get this loud to where it breaks, it, it creates a communication barrier the winch, but nothing is working. And so one of the main deck crew members sensing that they need to do something different to get this guy's attention, he runs away from where the mouse hole is to this nearby phone. And this phone is connected up to the hoist operator station and he picks it up and it starts dialing. Up in the hoist operator station, he's still not paying attention when the phone rings. He grabs the phone, puts it to his ear and immediately he's hit with screams to stop the winch. And so the hoist operator, totally confused, whips around and hits stop on the winch but it was too late. Just a few moments earlier, Gordon had finally been pulled all the way up right to the entrance oh. of the underside of this mouse hole. And as he reached this hole, he tried to position himself in a vertical position so that maybe he could slip his upper body into the hole and he could just kind of slide through the hole. He'd still be hurt by it, but it would limit the damage. However, because of his harness being on his waist right in front of him, he couldn't get himself into a vertical position. He could only lay back in a horizontal one. And so when he reached the underside of the main deck and he's looking right at this mouse hole, he just put his arms and his legs out and tried to push himself back as if he could fight the winch and keep himself from going into this hole. But there was nothing he could do. And so his pelvis first was pulled into the 10 inch hole. And as his body begins to literally break in half, he's screaming out in pain. And then by the time the hoist operator had hit stop, Gordon was already deceased, and only a section of his torso actually made it up through the hole. Gordon's company was found guilty of being blatantly delinquent on many safety protocols, and so they were fined 60,000 pounds, and then they paid an undisclosed amount to Gordon's family. Before we get into our next story, I want to talk about today's sponsor, Current. Current is the future. That's, that's a rough way to go, man. Like... 
That's a rough way to go, bro. Just to see it. You sh and then, like you said, the winch is moving slow. So you're slowly coming towards your demise. Slowly. Slowly. You sit like, man. In October of 1994, a middle-aged man named Ivan, who lived in Estonia, which is a country in Northern Europe, was walking in this forest looking for firewood. This forest butted up against the town he lived in, which was called Tamiku, and so as a result of his proximity to it, he had spent a lot of time in these woods over the years. But in general, his exposure to this forest was just on the fringes. He would only look for firewood along the perimeter of the woods. But for whatever reason, that day he was just really having a hard time finding good firewood and so at some point he decided to just walk deeper into the woods to see if he would have luck in there and so he turns and starts walking into the forest and very quickly when the town has kind of disappeared from view behind him he looked around and kind of liked being in the woods he didn't go for walks in the woods and suddenly he was on this nice nature walk and so he decided you know what i can wait on the firewood i'll just walk in the forest for a little while longer and enjoy myself and kind of meditate so he just continued walking walking deeper and deeper into the woods. And after walking for nearly an hour, just kind of mindlessly walking about, he sees up ahead there is very clearly a clearing. And then before the clearing is what looks like a chain link fence. Now he's never been this deep into the woods before, so he has no idea what this is, but he's obviously curious. And so he decides he'll go see what it is. And so he continues walking closer and closer to what obviously is a chain link fence. And as he's getting closer to it, the trees around him are beginning to thin out and suddenly before he even reaches the fence he gets a very clear view of what's on the other side and it's this huge multi-story building that almost looks like a factory or some sort of government facility and it's sitting maybe a couple hundred feet away from the fence right in the middle of this property and there's really nothing around it it's just this cleared out big open area with this big building right in the middle and there's a fence all the way around it and so Ivan is totally intrigued by this and so he he walks right up to the fence, he grabs onto it, and he tries to look and figure out what this building is. I thought he was about to say he walks up to the fence and he goes in. I was about to say, bro, do, do fences, are fences not to keep people out anymore? <laughs> like, I think along the way, we kind of lost that a little bit. We forgot about it. You know what I mean? Like, fences were there sometimes to keep you out, a lot of times. You know what I mean? But our little curie us being a curious George and, you know, curiosity killed the cat, it's never going to be good. This just don't look good. The building looked like something out of The Walking Dead. Like, there's a bunch of people huddled up in there that's trying to keep walkers out, and the fence is there to keep the walkers out. That's what it looks like to me. But there's no clear signage on it, and there's no people anywhere. It's completely barren. There's nothing but this building. And then he notices there's obviously graffiti on the sides of this building, and the doors and windows appeared to be boarded up. And so this building, whatever it is, is clearly abandoned. And the first thought that goes through Ivan's head is scrap metal. Times were tough for Ivan and his family, and so he and his two brothers, they all lived together, they would go out and they would steal scrap metal and sell it for a little bit of extra cash to make ends meet and provide now i can understand that there you know what i mean you gotta do what you gotta do to survive out here so i get that you know what i mean i thought it was just straight curiosity though and i was gonna be like yo mind mind your business bruh my business for their big family. And so he's looking at this big building thinking, you know, if I can get in there, I guarantee you there is some metal that I can steal and I can sell. And so Ivan stayed at this fence, just kind of staring at this building for a little while longer and continued to look around to make sure there weren't any people that he hadn't seen before. And after feeling satisfied that this really was a totally abandoned building, he turned around and began hustling back towards town. And when he finally made it to town, making sure to grab some firewood along the way, he rounded up his two brothers and and he told them about this find in the forest. And they all very excitedly agreed that that night they would go right back out there and they would go inside the building and see what they could find. And so around 9 p.m. that night, the brothers met up and they had flashlights and a set of bolt cutters and they headed into the nearby forest and they marched their way all the way up to this fence that Ivan had found earlier in the day. And they lifted their flashlights up and they scanned through the fence all over the property. And when they didn't see anyone, they put their flashlights down and one by one, they climbed up and over this fence 
And then once they were all on the other side, they began making their way up to this huge building sitting in the middle of the property. And when they got up to this building, they confirmed it definitely looked like it was abandoned, except all of the doors and windows were sealed in such a way that even with bolt cutters, there was just no way to pry them open. They were not going to get inside this building. And so after a little while of still trying to kind of smash their way into this building, the brothers all linked up and they decided, you know what, we're not getting in. And the longer we stay here, the better the chances are that we get caught. And so let's just head back. And so feeling totally dejected, they turn and they start walking back towards the fence they hopped in on. And as they're walking along, they're kind of shining their lights left and right and looking around. And off to the far right side of the property, there is this small shack that they had not noticed on their way in. And so the brothers look at each other and they're like, hey, you know, we're already on. I feel like something in, in the universe is giving them multiple opportunities to stay alive right now. And they're ignoring every single opportunity. This side of the fence, we might as well go check it out and see what's inside of it. Maybe there's scrap metal in there. And so the brothers turn and start making their way over to the shed. And when they get there, they discover it's only secured with a simple padlock on a wooden door. And so they get their bolt cutters, they pop off the lock, they open up the door, and there's initially nothing inside. At least that's what they think. But they move something on the ground and it reveals this stairwell that leads into this underground bunker. And now it's the middle of the night on this abandoned property they've snuck into. And so there's some apprehension, but they shine their lights down the steps and they didn't see any immediate hazards. And they're thinking, you know what? This is an adventure. Let's go down and see what's down there. And so they all went down the steps. And when they got down to the bottom, they turned the corner and they shined their light to see what's down here. And what was down there was this huge cellar that was full of scrap metal. There was metal all over the ground. And then there were also these shelves that went as far back as their lights could shine. And on the lower shelves, there were these weird square metal boxes that almost looked like briefcases. And then above those on the top shelf were 55 gallon aluminum drums. And in the brothers experience, these drums were very, very valuable, except they needed to make sure they weren't full of some liquid because if they're full, they weigh like 500 pounds and there's no way they'd be able to get them out and then trying to open them up and spill whatever's inside of them is hazardous for a lot of reasons. And so they walked over to the first 55 gallon drum they saw and they pushed it to see if it was empty. And the drum immediately rocked back and forth, echoing inside, indicating that it was empty. This was a huge, huge win. And so the brothers are totally amazed. They grab this first drum, they pull it off the shelf, and they wheel it over to the base of the steps. And then they go back to get another drum off the shelf, and they reach up, they grab another empty drum, and as they're pulling it off, it dislodges another 55-gallon drum that was nearby that was full of some liquid, so it weighed 500 pounds, and it comes crashing off the shelf and it lands on Ivan's leg, pinning him to the ground. And immediately the two other brothers pulled the drum off of Ivan, but it was obvious there had been significant damage done to his leg. Ivan couldn't even stand up anymore. And so the brothers are looking around thinking, man, this is an amazing haul, but if Ivan can't even walk, I mean, it's going to be a nightmare trying to haul this metal back while also supporting Ivan. And so they decided they would leave now and they would wait for Ivan to heal up and then they would come back and they would collect their amazing haul. And so the brothers, they reached down and they picked up whatever pieces of metal they could to just kind of stuff in their pockets. And then the two brothers supported Ivan and carried him up the stairs. And then they very slowly walked their way over to the fence. And then somehow the three of them got up and over the fence. And then very slowly, they made their way all the way through the forest back to Tamiku. And when they got there, the two brothers helped Ivan get into his house and they put him in his bed. And then Ivan went to sleep. The next morning when Ivan got up, he was expecting to feel better, but in fact, his leg felt exponentially worse. And then over the course of the next 72 hours, Ivan still believed if he just gutted it out and he waited, his leg would get better, but it just got worse and worse and worse. And so four days after this leg and he waited four days. Why? I get it, you were struggling for money, but hey, man, tell them to put you on one of them payment plans, man, where you pay them back like $10 a month, bro. Go see about your leg. 
surgery, Ivan was in so much pain, he couldn't do anything. And so he finally decided he had to go to the hospital. Yes. And so when he gets to the hospital, the doctor asks Ivan, you know, what happened to your leg? And Ivan would tell him that, oh, I was in the woods and a tree fell on my leg because he didn't want to admit to trying to steal scrap metal. And so the doctors, they accepted this. It seemed totally reasonable based on what his injury looked like. And so they admitted him to the hospital and put him in his hospital room. And right away, the doctors and nurses began administering all the treatments and things they would do for a crush injury. But it seemed like nothing was working. Over the course of the next several days, Ivan complained endlessly of the pain in his leg getting worse and worse and worse. And the swelling was going up. And overall, Ivan's health just continued to deteriorate over his stay in the hospital. What was in that drum? Something's in that drum, though. Something got to be that got on in. Maybe it cut him and it leaked into him and it's running up his leg and it's now getting into his bloodstream or already in his bloodstream. They may need to amputate it. Something, something, was, they need to figure out what that chemical was. Hospital. And see, he don't want to tell them, but bro, at this point, you got to come clean, say what it is for your life, man, so they could figure out what this chemical could possibly be or what was in that drum or what you could have got infected with it because it sounds like you got a bad infection. And then a week after being admitted to the hospital, so roughly 10 or 11 days after he was hurt, the doctors walked into his room and he was dead. His kidneys had just abruptly failed and the doctors and nurses had absolutely no idea why. And so they told the family, we don't know what happened to him. And so the family just had to collect Ivan's body and then they had a funeral for him. But they're all thinking to themselves, how could this have happened? He hurt his leg and then his kidneys failed? It Think about it, bro. Like this, this cellar or whatever they went in, this building, this fence around it to keep people out. Y'all broke into what is down there? What is down there? What is in that drum? It didn't make any sense. But before they could get any clarity on that, they were dealt another tragedy. The beloved family dog just kind of abruptly died. It was young, it was healthy, and so just like Ivan, it was like this totally unexpected death. And so once again, the family's asking, what's going on here? And then just a couple of days after that, Ivan's stepson came downstairs one morning complaining of feeling sick. And when his family looked at his hands, they were blistered and covered in boils and looked like he had just reached his hands into a fire or something, but he would tell his family, I didn't do that. I don't know what's going on with my hands. I don't know why I feel so sick. And so the family rushed the boy to the hospital and naturally the doctors asked him, you know, how did your hands get this way? What happened to you? And the boy would say, I don't know. But over the course of this initial discussion with doctors, the boy would tell them that over the last couple of days, he had been sifting through his stepfather, Ivan's possessions, and he had actually been using some of Ivan's tools from his toolbox. Now, the doctors were already aware of the strangeness around Ivan's death and they were aware of the sudden passing of the family dog and now they're seeing this boy who is showing up with these strange symptoms for no particular reason what and so the doctors knew something was off and so on a hunch they contacted the authorities and they told them what they thought and then later that day the authorities showed up at Ivan's family's house and when they got out of the car they were covered head to toe in white hazardous material mm -hmm. suits and they told the family to evacuate the house for their safety and then these people in suits got out these special wands and tools and they marched into the family home and immediately all their equipment led them to this one particular closet near the kitchen and when they opened it up in the closet was Ivan's toolbox the same one the boy had been handling over the past couple of days and when they opened that up they found there were lots of normal tools you would expect inside of a toolbox and they discovered one strange piece of scrap metal it was the only piece of scrap metal that Ivan had grabbed off the floor of that cellar and tucked in his pocket before he and his brothers had left. And then after Ivan had passed away, his stepson had been going through his things and he had discovered this piece of scrap metal. And for whatever reason, he had transferred it from the jacket to Ivan's toolbox. What Ivan and his family didn't know was that that piece of metal was extremely dangerous because it came not from some abandoned building on some abandoned 
abandoned property in the middle of the forest. It came from an abandoned nuclear waste storage facility. That is what Ivan and his brothers had snuck onto. But because Ivan and his brothers had hopped over that side fence, they didn't see any of the warning signs that are posted on the front of the front gates telling people to stay back. Inside that cellar that the brothers were in, those small metal briefcase looking things on the lower shelves were shields for radiation. Inside of each of them was radioactive metal. And when that full 55 gallon drum came crashing off the shelf and smashed into Ivan's leg, his leg was not the only thing it smashed into. It smashed into one of those metal briefcases and broke it open, sending the radioactive metal inside of it flying out and it landed right next to Ivan on the ground. And so when the brothers scrambled to pick up whatever loose scrap metal there was on the ground, Ivan unfortunately grabbed one piece and it was the radioactive one. By the time Ivan finally got back to his house. He was actually already dead. He just didn't know it yet. That piece of metal had been inside of his jacket pocket and it had been pressed against his body long enough that he had been dealt a fatal dose of radiation. There was nothing anybody could have done even if they knew what had happened to him. As for the dog, it used to sleep on Ivan's jacket and it did so when this piece of scrap metal was inside of it and so it too died of radiation poisoning. As for Ivan's stepson, the reason his hands had been so badly burned and why he'd become so sick, that was just from his brief exchange of touching the piece of scrap metal and then putting it in Ivan's toolbox. That alone had done that much damage to him. When the doctors considered the strangeness of Ivan's death, the dog's death, and now this boy's symptoms, they did suspect radiation poisoning. And so that was how the authorities were able to get to their house and very quickly locate that toolbox. Amazingly, Ivan's stepson and the rest of Ivan's family, including his two brothers, would make full recoveries. However, several months after this event and after authorities had come in and said their house was clear of radiation, the grandmother would suddenly die totally unexpectedly. She was healthy. Nothing was wrong with her. And so even though it was not officially cited as having been caused by radiation, many people believe it's from the exposure she had to this piece of scrap metal. Bro, them sneaking into a place, trying to be discreet, don't want to get caught missed out on the radioactive signs that's tragic fam that's i didn't know i was saying in the beginning the entire time yo fences are made to keep you out bro always remember that. i think we forget that even me as a kid i'm hopping fences and doing things i could have been i could have been in a situation just like this just like this easily like whoa 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 if that don't make you say whoa and back up that story right there alone, I'd never be that curious again, ever. In 2017, 71-year-old Bernard Gore was a retiree living in Tasmania, which is an island state of Australia. In January of that year, he and his wife of 50 years, Angela, decided to go visit their daughter who lived in Sydney, Australia. Now, they made this trip with some regularity and they developed a sort of routine for every time they visited. They would land in Sydney and then the first day they would spend it entirely with their daughter at her house. And then the next day, Angela would get up early and she would head out into town and do some shopping on her own. And then sometime in the afternoon, Bernard would head out and he would meet up with her for lunch at a very popular spot. It was called the Westfield Center Mall and they had an amazing food court. So on January 5th of that year, Bernard and Angela, they land in Sydney and like they always did, they went straight to their daughter's house and they spent the day with her. And then early the next morning, Angela got up and she headed out to do her shopping. And before she left, she confirmed with her husband that they would meet up for lunch at Westfield Center Mall. Now, as it happened that day, Angela actually chose to do her shopping at Westfield Center Mall. And so she was there around lunchtime when she was supposed to meet Bernard. And so when she looked at her watch and she realized it was time to meet him, she just simply stepped out of the shop she was in and headed over to the food court. And when she got there, she found their meeting spot. It was in front of one of their favorite restaurants and she sat down and then she scanned around looking for her husband, but inside of this busy food court, she couldn't see him. And so she looked at her watch again and she realized 
noticed she was a couple of minutes early and so she grabbed a menu and she began looking for what she was going to order while she waited for him to show up. But 15 minutes would go by and Bernard would not show up and so now he was late. And so Angela at this point she pulls her phone out and she tries calling her husband but he didn't answer. However, that was kind of common for Bernard so not necessarily a red flag. Angela would continue to try calling her husband for the next several minutes and each time he would not answer. And so eventually Angela just gets frustrated and she's thinking to herself, you know, maybe he just got sidetracked and he's walking around the mall somewhere because Bernard was known for being a big window shopper. And as soon as Angela thought that, she was like, that's going to be it. And it was so frustrating for her that he had just totally blown off their lunch date. And so she stands up, she abandons her table, she's totally annoyed, and she heads out into the main shopping area to go find her husband. And so she's walking along, looking in each of the windows, expecting to see her husband. And at the same time, she's looking over her shoulder back towards the food court to see if maybe Bernard had shown up. But after 30 minutes of wandering around kind of right near the food court and not seeing him anywhere, Angela thinks to herself, you know what? I bet he thought we were supposed to meet at our daughter's house first. And so he probably hasn't even left the house yet. I bet he's just there waiting for me. And so Angela, when she realizes this, she stops looking for him in the mall. She turns around and she begins walking towards the mall exit. But before she reaches the exit door, a terrifying thought crosses her mind. What if Bernard got confused and has no idea where he is right now? A recent unfortunate development for Bernard was that he was showing early signs of dementia. It hadn't fully taken a hold of him yet, but he was clearly starting to forget things that he shouldn't. And so as soon as Angela thought of this, she went from being annoyed with her husband to being very worried about her husband. Heck yeah, I would too. Like, and then at the same time, if, if we know, why are we letting him trap? No, 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 no. No, I'd have lost my mind right right then and there. And so she sped through those doors outside and speed walked all the way back to her daughter's house, which was not far from the mall. And the whole time she's walking, she's telling herself she's going to walk inside and she's going to see Bernard. He's going to be in the house. But when she got to the house and went inside and saw her daughter, her daughter said, no, dad left about two hours ago to go meet you. I haven't seen or heard from him since. Now, of course, both of them were extremely worried for Bernard, but they decided to just stay calm that the best thing they could do right now would just be to stay put, stay at their daughter's house and wait for Bernard to eventually come back because the only other logical place he would go would be his daughter's house. And so they sat at the house, just kind of waiting, looking at the door, waiting for him to come in, but he didn't. And by 8 p.m., six hours after anybody had last seen Bernard, he still had not shown what, uh, Get a search for, hey, no, no, somebody called police, search dogs anything i want everybody here no daughter you stay here i'm going back to the mall i'm gonna go through this mall i'm gonna run through everywhere if he come through here just call me i'm not gonna sit there and wait you kidding me Shown up, they couldn't get in touch with him, and so Angela called the police and reported him missing. Immediately, the police contacted the Westfield Center Mall security team and said, hey, you know, we're looking for this guy, and they went right down to the food court where Bernard and Angela had said they were going to meet, and the mall security team walked all around, and they walked into all the nearby shops and kind of scanned the- I don't care, check the cameras. Roll, roll a videotape, show me the beam footage. Like, I need to see if he was there and these, these hours that we've been looking for them immediate vicinity near their meeting spot, but they reported back to police that there was no sign of Bernard. And they would also tell police that after reviewing their camera footage, and this mall had hundreds of cameras covering every angle, inside and out, I mean, everything is covered. They would tell police, you know, after reviewing the footage, we didn't see Bernard enter or exit the mall at any point today. He was not here. And so the police, they take this information and they go back to Angela that night and they say, hey, look, you know, we talked to the mall and based on their security footage, they have no record of Bernard ever being in the mall. Do you have any idea where he could have gone? And Angela would say, no, the only places would have been the mall or maybe at our daughter's house. This is also when Angela explained to police that her husband had early signs of dementia. And so it was possible that he might have just gotten confused and he could be out on the street somewhere. But she assured the police that her husband, whenever this happened, whenever he got confused, he would just sit down and he would try to ask 
ask for help from anybody passing by, or he would just sit where he was and he would wait for his family to come find him. And so with this knowledge, the police went back out and they widened their search and they began looking in all the areas that were within walking distance of the Westfield Center Mall. This has got to be one of the scariest incidents to have to go through, man. Just knowing your your loved one is out here and could be completely clueless as to where he thinks he is. You know what I'm saying? Like, bro, that tear your heart out of your chest. At the same time, Angela and her daughter began trying to retrace Bernard's footsteps from the daughter's home in the direction of the Westfield Center Mall to see if maybe there was something obvious along the route that might have sidetracked him and kind of led him astray and that maybe he'd be somewhere else in those directions. But as they were walking around, there really was nothing that stood out to them. And then eventually it just got too dark out and they had to just turn it in and go back to their house and hope that the next morning when they got up, the police would have found Bernard and that he was okay. But the next morning when they got up, the police had not found Bernard. There was no sign of him. There was no clues, nothing. And unfortunately, over the next several weeks, there was no sign of Bernard. Nobody knew what happened to him. On January 27th, so three weeks after Bernard... They better not find him in that mall. They better not find him in that mall, bro. I would be furious. Bernard had gone missing, a maintenance worker at the Westfield Center Mall was walking down the staff-only passageway. Oh. It was basically like this tunnel with no windows, all concrete. They kind of looped around the outside of the mall to help workers get to and from certain locations in the building. He's walking down this passageway when he looks down this one hallway that was very rarely used, oh. and he sees at the end of it, barely lit up from the lights inside, there looks to be some equipment kind of propped up against the wall. And he's thinking to himself, there's no reason someone would leave their equipment at the end of this very rarely used hallway. It didn't make any sense. And so he decided to walk down and see whose equipment it was. And so he's making his way down and he's getting closer and closer and he still can't quite figure out what it is. The lighting's not great. But when he gets close enough to see what it is, he stops where he is. He turns around and he runs back down the hallway. He finds the nearest exit. He goes outside and he calls the police. Back on January 6th, on the day that Bernard and yeah, I guess you can't really be mad at security at that point. He said nobody goes down there or something, but I still be like, man, come on, man. Y'all didn't check this area. Like, I wanted every inch of this mall checked, but man, that's rough. That's scary. That's rough. Angelo were supposed to meet up for lunch. Bernard did leave his daughter's house and he walked straight to the mall and he got there. He arrived at the Westfield Center Mall and was picked up on camera walking into their food court. But the staff at the mall who reviewed the footage for police, they only looked at a handful of cameras. There's hundreds of cameras. They only looked at a couple. And so they missed this crucial footage of Bernard. And what the footage would have shown them was Bernard making his way into the food court ahead of Angela. Angela is nowhere to be found. And Bernard, instead of sitting down at their meeting spot in front of this restaurant, Bernard suddenly looks like he's confused and he turns and he walks to this emergency exit door. He presses it in, he steps inside and the door shuts behind him. Now, the Westfield Center Mall is not your average mall. It is massive. There are six floors to it, nearly 300 shops and restaurants. That's like a needle in a haystack, man. Goodness gracious. But what truly makes it massive is something that the public doesn't usually see. And that is behind staff only doors and emergency exit doors like the one Bernard had just gone through are nearly eight miles of windowless concrete, narrow stairwells and tunnels that loop all around the outside of the building. And once Bernard had gone through that emergency exit door and that door had shut and locked behind him, the only way for him to return to the food court and meet his wife would be if he completely exited the mall and looped all the way back around. But in order to exit the mall from where he just entered, he would need to go to a very specific exterior fire exit door that was several floors below him and to get to it required following this very confusing signage on the walls. And so if you did it correctly, you would basically go down the hallway, find this particular stairwell, you'd go down a couple of levels, and then at some point without really any signage, you would get to the 
appropriate floor and you'd go down the hallway into this maze of more hallways and then finally you'd reach this kind of nondescript exit door and that would be your exit. Finding your way from where Bernard entered all the way to the exit of the mall would be challenging for someone thinking clearly and clearly Bernard was not. Bernard was confused and likely really didn't understand where he was or what he was doing or why he was there and so he did not follow these directions. Instead, he just began wandering down the hallway and he would have immediately passed the one stairwell that would have very circuitously brought him down. But I man, that's rough, man. Just thinking somebody's sitting there, they, they, they have no help. They're, they're out there alone. They're trying to figure things out. Their mind is probably confused, can't understand fresh like all these emotions that he must have been going through man that would tear me apart to just think about that knowing my family member was helpless and there was nothing i was nowhere around to help them in their time of need like that would that would crush me bro that would crush me like like you talking about a person right now who my grandmother like everything to me you know what i mean that's oh my that oof Heesh. Like, I'm getting, I gotta come out this hoodie, bro. It's, I'm getting hot just thinking about it out of the building. He passed that stairwell and he just kept on walking and eventually he walked into this staff only area, which was even more confusing because there was no signs telling him where to go and virtually every door he encountered would have been locked. And so as Bernard wandered through this concrete maze and got more and more mixed up and confused, he most likely began yelling out for help. But his sound could not have penetrated the walls, which means the only people who could have heard his cries would have been people inside the hallway with him. And unfortunately, this section of tunnels that Bernard had found himself in was rarely, if ever, used by any of the staff. And to make matters worse, the mall security guards were supposed to come in and do regular checks of all these eight miles of tunnels and stairwells specific. Now that, that would piss me off right there. They, they, they better had kept that information from me to see if people got lost in them, but over time, the security guards kind of stopped doing that. And there were no security cameras inside of this particular segment of tunnels that Bernard found himself in, and there was no cell phone reception. So had he tried calling anyone, it wouldn't have worked. And so truly, Bernard was on his own. And so after several hours or days of Bernard aimlessly wandering around this maze, hitting dead end after dead end and reaching locked door after locked door, Bernard at some point turned to corner and looked down at the end of a hallway and he saw there was a chair up against the side of the wall and like he was programmed to do anytime he got confused he rushed over to it and he sat down and he began waiting for a passerby to help him or his family to find him but unfortunately help never came and he would eventually pass away on that chair on january 27th that maintenance worker he discovered bernard's body Following his death, the Westfield Center Mall came out and said they made drastic changes to their security system and how they track people while they're on their property. So that's going to do it, guys. That's a messed up way to go out. That's, that hurt, bro. I ain't even going to lie to you. That isn't even my grandparent. And I'm, I, man, I, that's a tearjerker. That's just to know that he was there. He was probably like, yelling and screaming for help he was confused frustrated alone just all those emotions man and nobody there to help him that's dope Whew. and then you got security guards that aren't doing their job probably overworked underpaid so they have doing the job and yeah man yeah i that mall, I, I have to move out of that town, bro. I could, I, there's no way I could even drive around and drive past that mall and and not be furious and want the thoughts I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah, let me just stop, you know what I mean? But yeah, that's one of the worst stories you could ever hear, man. Take care of the elderly, older folks, man. Be there for them. And uh, if you know your people got early signs of dementia or different things like that, memory loss, 
man, try to try to be with them at all times. And I know it's frustrating because a lot of times they push you away, but try to do everything you can, man. You know what I mean? Whew, this is a rough one. I, I'm going to go take a walk after this one. So y'all get at me in the comment section. Let me know what you think, man. You know what to do. I'm gone. Peace.